Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time of the workers' retreat. We praise you because you brought this workers' retreat near and close to every one of us. Lord, we thank you because we do not have to travel far for this time, but we can all be together in this place to share your word together. And Lord, we are praying that what we share and what we receive will be of great, tremendous benefit to everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we're asking that you'll speak to us more and more. And you'll give us the word that will change our ministries, that will change our outreach, that will change our method of work, that will change the impact and the influence we have on people in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we know with you it's a small thing. It's a simple thing to make use of any of us. Therefore, Lord, we are praying that you will reveal unto us what we have to do, in which way we have to be, so that you'll do the best with every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that we'll not play at the work of God. We pray that we'll not waste our time and waste our lives while we're doing this service for the Lord. Father, we have a single life to live. And we pray that this single life will amount to something important in your sight in Jesus' name. Amen. For our brothers, for our sisters, for all the workers, whatever the category of work we're doing, Lord, we pray that we'll submit completely unto you and unto your word. And this work will be done successfully, will be done in a profitable manner will be done to bring multitudes and thousands and millions to the kingdom in Jesus' name. Talk to us. Circumcise our hearts. Wash us clean. Put your fire within our spirits. In Jesus' name, I pray. We can sit down now. Already we had started this program since last night. I couldn't be around last night because... I traveled away from Lagos to the United States of America since the 3rd of July, and I only came back last Sunday. And it was a busy time in the U.S., and then I felt that I should be in Lagos yesterday for the Thursday Miracle Revival Hour. Then I wanted to come early this morning, but the flights disappointed. But we believe that all things work together for good. And um, now we're around. And I want to handle the message now, the key to the double portion anointing. And um, we'll be changing the program a little. After this, we'll go for a meal. And then when you come back from your meal, we'll go on as far as the Lord will lead us. You don't mind that you'll keep late tonight. Is that all right? Yes. Now, I want to read to you from Second Kings chapter 2. The key to double portion anointing. There are many people that are wondering what a child of God can do today. There are many people that are wondering what a man or what a woman can do today. Can we still be used of God as God used the people in the days of old? And in the New Testament, the answer is yes. And it doesn't matter to God whether we are young or old. It doesn't matter to God whether we are men or women. It doesn't actually matter to God whether we are wise or unwise, Greek or barbarian, educated or not educated. But if we discover the key of what it means to have its double portion anointing, then we can do what he wants us to do. And we're picking up the example of Elisha that followed after Elijah. I'm reading from chapter 2 of Second Kings, verse 1. And it came to pass when the Lord will take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Let's stop there. The time had come that Elijah will hand over the ministry and the great work he had been doing unto 
Elisha. And at this time, Elisha did not receive or he had not got all that he needed to get so that the work will be done successfully. But then at this time, that God was to take away Elijah, Elisha had been with him. And he had been following on. And he had been committed to what the Lord wanted him to do. In First Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19. I want you to look at the call of Elijah. When the Lord called him, the response that he made. In verse 19. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shepherd, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he was the twelve. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after him, after Elijah. And said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father, say bye bye to my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done unto thee? And he returned back from him, and took a yoke of oxen, and slew them, and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen, and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose, and went after Elijah, and ministered unto him. Here we have the call of Elisha. Elijah had been following the Lord for some time. You know the problems that he had urged. He had been threatened by Jezebel. And Jezebel said, threatened that he should kill Elijah. Elijah ran away. Eventually, God spoke to Elijah and said, What are you doing here? Why have you led the work? Why have you led that revival? Why is it that you are hiding here? And he said, They're seeking to kill me. They've killed other people. I'm the only one remaining. The seeking my life. And God said, I still have 7,000 men that have not bowed the knee unto Baal. And said, now you'll go back and you'll choose Elisha. Elisha might have known the weakness of Elijah. Elisha might have known the fact that Elijah ran away. Nobody saw him in town. But when Elijah came, and threw mantle upon Elisha. Number one thing we find in life of Elisha is that there was humility. Oh, he didn't say, I can't follow you. You're a runaway prophet. Jezebel threatened you and you ran away. I won't follow you. I know all the story about you. I know you're weak. I know you're running away from the work. If I'm going to be called by God, I want a call to come from another direction. Number one, before you can ever be called to do a greater work than Elijah, there must be humility to accept the ministry of Elijah. I want to be great. I want to work for God. I want to serve the Lord. I want to be a great evangelist. And I want to be a great man of God. Before you can do that, you must be able to accept in humility the ministry of the person of the people that God has put over you. And he accepted. But then another thing is that when he received the call, Elijah did not preach much. Elijah did not say much. Just threw the mantle over him. That was a parable. That was an illustration. That was a symbol. And he accepted that symbol. A word is enough for the wise. A word or an action is enough for the person that wants to totally commit himself unto the Lord. 
And he said, I know you are calling me. I know the meaning of that. You throw the mantle upon me. And I know the meaning of that. You know, in your own life, when you are called to be a worker, it may just be that the state overseer saw you and said, come in, we're having workers meeting today. Join them. And you're still waiting for a voice. And you don't need any other voice. Because a mantle has been thrown upon you. But you didn't realize. And you're still saying, well, I hope they're not going to make me full-time worker because I still want to go to school. That capital of 12000 I have in the bank, I want to use it to raise up a great business. I hope this man is not telling me to leave my business of uh, plowing and then just join the people that don't have any salary. Which one do you want? The double portion or the salary? You refine the water for the whole of the city by the power of God or your business. Having power to cleanse the leper or your business. Raising the dead by the dead bones when, even after you have died or your business. Just passing through and yet there will be wonderful mighty miracles happening in your life or your business. Being able to, by the power of the Lord, to say for this whole nation that had been in famine, I tell you tomorrow that a shekel of flour will be sold at this price or your business. Oh, this man knew that greater things were ahead. Because of that, he said, all I need to do is just to go back home and say bye-bye to daddy and mommy and I'm following you. He didn't say, what accommodation are you providing for me? What salary are you going to provide for me? What am I going to get? Oh, he knew that the mantle meant a lot. He did not delay when the call of God came upon his life. I thank God many years ago. The day I was born again, from that very day, I knew that I was to preach the gospel. I didn't know where I would preach the gospel, to who I would preach the gospel. I didn't know whether I would be preaching to illiterates or literates, whether I would be preaching to men or women, whether I would be preaching to those who are old or young, but I knew I will preach the gospel. Whether to one person or one thousand, I didn't know. Whether in a secondary school or university, I didn't know. Whether I will be preaching in Nigeria or outside Nigeria, I didn't know. But I knew that I will preach the gospel. And I said, Lord, whatever it will take, away from me, away from my life. Whatever friends it will separate away from me. And whatever I will have to suffer for it, Lord, I surrender. I am going to preach the gospel. And thank God here am I today. And I'm preaching the gospel. But the very first day, I knew it. And I accepted it. I didn't know what I would suffer by age. I didn't know what friends I would lose by age. I didn't know what salary I may not get by it. I didn't know what dressing I may not have by it. I didn't know what promotion I may not have because of it. I didn't know that I might have to give up being a professor at the university because of it. But I said, whatever it will take, I'm willing to get rid of those 12 oxen and follow the Lord. And it pays to serve the Lord. And today, you are hearing your own call. I don't know whether, where you'll be tomorrow in different parts of Africa or outside Africa or in this state or in another state but the point is before you ever know where you are going you consecrate yourself Abraham consecrated before he knew where he was going Isaac accepted all that his father said about God before he knew where he was going Jacob accepted when God said I will be with you where will I be? he, doesn't, he didn't know but he accepted the promises of the Lord and the consecration before he knew where he was going. And Peter, Jesus called him, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Will that take me to prison? I don't want to answer that, follow me. Will that take me only to Jerusalem? I don't want to answer that, just follow me. Will that take me to Samaria? I don't want to know that, follow me. He followed before, he consecrated before he knew every place that he will go. How about Paul the Apostle? Lord, what shall I do? And Jesus said, Go to Damascus. It will be showing you what you will do. But first, accept. First, consecrate. Without any delay. You know what delays people? And there are hundreds of people that should be here today. They are not here today. You know why? They don't know what the future holds for them. 
If I accept being a house fellowship leader, will I ever become an area leader? Nobody can answer that for you. If you are going to consecrate, consecrate now. Before you ever become an area leader. Will I ever become a zonal leader? Nobody can answer that for you. Before you can ever tell, just consecrate your life now. Well, I'm only a woman. And from the things I see, from the things I sense, I don't know whether they'll use women to preach and become evangelists. I don't know myself. All I know is that all things are possible with God. All I know is that with God, nothing shall be impossible. All I know is that all that God is waiting for is for you to be yielded and consecrated to him. Anybody can be an evangelist. Anybody can be a prophet. Anybody can be an apostle. Anybody can be a great man or woman of God. But before you know where you are going, you consecrate to the Lord. And are there many, not many people that have been in deeper life before? As maybe house fellowship leader? And they promise them something somewhere. And they say, well, you are just house fellowship leader in that uh, ministry. If you come over here, we'll make you a pastor. And he said, well, if that is what I'm going to get, I think I better leave right now. Foolish man. He doesn't know that if he remained, he was to become more than a pastor. But because of walking by sight, what they are promising him, what he can see, he doesn't want to consecrate before what he will get eventually. And Elisha said, Elijah, I know you are calling. I know it's not you. I know it's your God calling me into your ministry, into the ministry that he has given you. And Elisha did not, Elijah did not tell him that God spoke to me. Now there are many things that God speaks to me that I don't uh, want to tell people. There are many things I know that I don't normally and ordinarily discuss with people. Why? Because they are the secrets of the Lord. And the secrets of the Lord are with them that fear him. And there is a time and a place when you share what to share. And Abraham did not tell Lot everything that God told him. Lot didn't know. And when he saw the well-watered place, he said, Well, if it is like this, let me choose that place. Abraham said, no, I'm not going to say because he's going, I will share this and this with him. He said, okay, God bless you. you. If you take the left, I'll take the right. If you take the right, I'll take the left. You can go, but I won't tell you the secret. Moses did not tell Joshua everything that God told him. In fact, he didn't even lay hands on him until the very last time that was to go away. When God said, now you are going away, and it's Joshua that will take over. And therefore, lay your hands on him. Moses didn't tell him everything. And Elijah, look at it, the story that we read. When he was to be taken away by a wild wind, Elijah knew. And Elijah didn't say, Elisha, now come. I have some secrets to tell you. Never. If you want to consecrate, consecrate before you know what is coming in the future. Zona leader, state overseer, district pastor, or city pastor, whatever it is God wants to do, leave all that with him and say, Lord, like Elisha, like he waited in obedience and patience until the double portion came, Lord, I'll be following. And when he said, now, let me go and kiss my father and mother and then I'll come back. Elisha said, what have I got to do with you? You think I'm going to tell you anything? Because you said you are going to see your father and mother and come back? If you come back, praise the Lord. If you don't come back, praise the Lord anyhow. And he went quickly and he came back. A man that wants the double portion of the Lord never wastes time. When I got converted, there are many people that wanted to be my friends, to tie me down and discuss with me. What's your plan in the future? When are you going to get married? When are you going to have children? Everybody wanted to discuss with me. Nowadays, university that you are going, what's the, what do you want to do after that? What do you want? I didn't have friends. No single friend. I, I loved people, but... I didn't let them stand between me and Christ. Because many of them will be saying, Oh, that's too much to give up to the Lord. That's too much to consecrate to the Lord. That's too much to yield over to the Lord. Because of that, I didn't have an intimate, bosom, close friend. 
I wanted Jesus and Jesus is enough for me. Is Jesus enough for you? You know, there are many people, I know there are many people that got saved before I got saved in this Nigeria. I know there are many people that God called before he called me in this Nigeria, but many of them, they stay too long with friends discussing. And by the time you finish all that discussion, they will say, are you going to give everything up for the Lord? Are you going to yield that over to the Lord? That's too much. That's too much. You're going to give all your life. When are you going to be with your family? When are you going to be with this? When are you going to be with that? But thank God that Jesus is a friend to me. And uh, like I traveled out on the 3rd of July. On the 5th of July, I had to preach three times. And almost every day throughout, I've been busy ministering. A particular Sunday, I preached four times. Three times in a large church, and then the fourth time in the evening service of another church. Then finishing that, the second day went to another place and started some meetings all over again. A particular day having to record five times all over. Five times on radio. And then go to another place, record five times on television. And yet, even after all that, come back and preach again. And then I came back to Nigeria on Sunday night, and Monday I started preaching again two times on Monday. Yesterday, three times. You know, if I have friends that are too close to me, they will say, take it easy so you don't die. But I don't know whether I'm going to die or not. I don't know whether the rapture will take place before I finish. So that's why I don't take it easy. But the point is, if there are friends, they will say, take it easy. Take it easy. Take it easy. The people that are taking it easy, many of them are in the mortuary right now. Slowly. Slowly. While they are walking slowly, the car ran over them. They died. While they are walking slowly, the house fell over them. While they are going slowly, the devil strangled them. But those who are fast for the Lord. Those who are willing to give up everything for the Lord. Those who work hard, they never die in time. Abraham worked hard, didn't die in time. Moses worked hard, didn't die in time. Joshua worked hard, hard to the point that he said, Lord, it's coming to an evening. I don't want the evening to come right now because the battle is still long. Son, stand up over there. I need more time for service. He didn't die in time. Paul the apostle on the sea, on the road, in the wilderness, in the prison, in the synagogue, in the temple, in the marketplace, in the theater, everywhere. He didn't die in time. The aged apostle Paul. Who are the people that die in time? The people that are too fat, too sleepy, too sluggish, too slow, unconsecrated, unyielded to God. Elisha was called and there was no delay. I hope you will not delay. I hope you will say, Lord, if you are calling me, I don't want a friend to delay me. I don't want anybody to pull me back. I don't want anyone to say, take it slowly. Ah, you don't know Elijah. You follow Elijah? Elijah is an eccentric man. He can call down fire at any time to burn you up if you are following him. Well, if he calls down fire, is the fire of the Lord. If the fire of the Lord burns me, praise the Lord. I'll follow him. I'll go after him. And I don't care whether I die while following Elijah or not. Those are the men that God will give the double anointing and the double portion. But the people that are saying, well, I don't know whether I want to give myself to the Lord. I don't know about this sanctification. You know, those who doubt righteous living, they never get much from the Lord. Oh, I praise the Lord for Elisha. When Elijah came, suppose he got he, he met a girlfriend with Elisha. Will he throw his mantle on him? When God called Elijah and said, Elijah, go and anoint Elisha. Where is he? He's on the field. Go and see him. And I was going to see him. And he got there. And then he met a girlfriend with him. And they were playing together. Having fun together. Seeing together. Elijah will run back and say, God... What happened? 
Oh, here, God will say, I chose him, but now I've rejected him. You've just had it. I'll give you another man better than himself. But when he got there, Elisha was alone. No girlfriend. No sin. The oxen he was plying with, he didn't steal it. There was no restitution that has not been made that Elijah would say, go and finish up that. Every restitution had been made. Elisha was ready for anything. Ready for death, ready for God, ready for ministry, ready for anything. If God said, now stop, he didn't have to put his house in order. Everything was in order. And so when Elijah came, he threw the mantle upon him. Many people are saying, I want the double portion of the Spirit of God. But your house is not in order. The account of the ministry in your hand is not in order. Zona leader, full-time worker, pastor, state overseer. How is your account? If God said now, I want to call you out of that place into a larger ministry, would you say yes, praise the Lord, all the account is in order, all the work is in order, all the message is in order, all the record, everything is in order. I can move out of this place and go to another place without any fear. That's that, how that man was ready. But many of us are not ready. Ladies, are all your accounts in order? Or is there malice with somebody? Elisha did not say, Elijah, you throw your mantle on me. I know you are calling me, but I'm quarreling with somebody. Let me go and search my quarrel. Otherwise, I know God cannot use me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Therefore, because of that malice and bitterness, let me go and settle. Why not settle, have a clean slate, and then wait for the mantle to come? Why are you dragging bitterness and unforgiving spirit and attitude with you? You'll not greet so-and-so. You'll not greet so-and-so. No wonder when the angel of the Lord came, he passed you by. Oh, you say the angel of the Lord had never visited me. You don't know. He didn't call your name because he saw the condition where you were. God came to Samuel and said, Samuel, Samuel, Ophni was sleeping in the same house. God didn't call him. You know why? They had something to settle. Phinehas was sleeping in the same house. You know why? They had something to settle. But when there's nothing to settle, when you know by the grace of God, my heart is ready. My heart is clean. No restitution to be made. No lies that I told before that I need to adjust now. Everything has been settled. And you know you can settle everything even this afternoon because you don't know when he will visit you. The Lord can visit some of you in a mighty way this evening. But if he comes and there are things that are not settled, the grumbling, the murmuring, the bitterness, the unforgiving spirit, the stealing, you see, walker stealing, oh yes. How can a walker steal? Uh -uh. I've seen walkers that steal. You give them retreat money to go and prepare food. They put 50 naira in their pocket and say, it's where you work that you eat. That's stealing. Sister, go and buy this... Uh, Clothes for banner. Okay. And I think it costs about uh, 16 uh, naira uh, per piece. I think so. You got there, you saw it at 12 naira 50 kobo. Ah. God, I praise your name. Already the overseer has said it cost uh, 16 naira. And therefore, the rest of the amount, maybe only 24 naira 50 kobo, you put in your pocket, is where you work that you eat. That's stealing. Of course, you are still a real leader. Like Saul, you are still there as a figurehead. Or you are a pastor. And they said, in our church, we are going to, we need to buy land, we need to buy this, we need to buy this. Okay. From the capital, you are given money. Now, negotiate properly. Don't let those uh, villagers cheat you. All right. Then you got there, and instead of the price, before you beat everything down, and you said, after all, it's because I was clever, I beat the price now. This uh, 200 naira that remained is my own. It's the blessing of God that maketh rich and added no sorrow. 
But your own blessing is adding conf conflict in your own heart, confusion in your own heart. You are a thief. Now, which one will you choose? Keep the 200 naira and lose the double portion. Or, even if it's, it will make you feel ashamed, go to the leader and say, this five naira I took, I didn't know that I was doing wrong. Or I knew, but I was too ashamed to own it all. But this is the five naira. I return it. Well, the pastor might say, ah, ah, brother, we trusted you and you did that. I'm sorry. You know that even though you trusted me, I was not trustworthy. But just forgive me. We will discipline you. I praise the Lord. You discipline me, I will remain. While I'm waiting under that discipline, the double portion can come. But to be ashamed and to say, no, 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 I will never confess. Never confess. Keep your five naira. Keep your five naira. And you remain like that. You won't have more than that five naira all through life. You know there are churches where they say, no, we don't believe restitution. That's their headache. They don't believe restitution. They keep just the 10 naira. They keep just the 20 naira. Do they have the double portion? No, God will say, you can't have both together. You're stolen those, the 10 naira, you are keeping it, keep it. I withdraw and withhold my double portion. Oh, I praise the Lord many years ago. When the Lord convicted me of things I'd done that were wrong. And I said, Lord, I want to work for you. And yet this restriction you want me to make is so hard for me. What am I going to do? Oh, but thank God. Thank God. It was on the 17th of November, 1965. I've been afraid of that thing. And I said, Lord, you must do this thing for me. My heart opened up. I made up my mind and I said, even if I get into prison for doing what I'm going to do now, I will do it. About 5.30 in the evening. I remember the place. I remember the time. I remember the location. The peace of God flooded my spirit. It was that same day, that same time I got sanctified. And everything got settled. And I, say, and I said, Lord, now that that thing has been settled, I am waiting. I am waiting. Of course, the double anointing did not even come that day, that week, that month, even that year. But I thank God I have got something now I didn't have at that time. I thank God because now, everywhere I go, God is glorifying himself. And I cannot tell you, because I don't want you, I cannot tell you the many, many things that God himself, that he has spoken to me, and that he is doing, that he has spoken to other people, but because I settled all the accounts. State overseer, have you settled the accounts? Zona leader, pastor, have you settled the account? Or are you just doing the work with human energy? I don't. People wonder, they ask me, how are you able to preach this many times? I say, I don't know. Because I used to be a weak person. I used to be somebody that couldn't carry, uh, you know, too many uh, buckets of water. I'll get tired within 10 minutes. I used to be somebody that will not be able to, you know, do anything at all that is strenuous. But I praise the Lord because he renews my strength. But that's because I made up my mind that whatever people think, whatever people say, I'm going to do what I know the Lord wants me to do. And if you'll take the same step, you know, if all of us here, as we're here this afternoon, if we will receive the double portion of the Spirit of God, you tell me. All over, in all the states you have come from, millions will be saved. Millions will be brought into the kingdom. Millions will have the power of God in their lives. And I know that it will happen in Jesus' name. Yeah. Now, I've told you that when Elisha came, when Elijah saw Elisha, he didn't see a girlfriend with him. But... Many of you that are not married yet, in your locations where you are, what do you do? You don't know when an angel will visit you. 
Oh, people say, angels don't visit people today like in the time of old. How do you know? Just because he has not visited you. The people of old, they lived right. They invited the presence of God in their midst. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Elijah. Now you have seen Elijah living with a widow woman. No other adult man in that same house for more than two years. And yet, that woman was never intimate with Elijah. And when the son died, the woman did not come and say, Elijah, you know, all the foolish things we have been doing together, that's the one that killed my child now. You see now, all the sins we are committing. No, no. He said, man of God, you have called my sin to remembrance, not our sins. Because Elijah, even though he lived with that woman, in the house of that woman, very, very clean. Are you clean like that? You want double portion. You want the anointing of God. Are you clean like that? And Elijah, if Elijah had been committing immorality with her while they were living in the house together, will he have the boldness to say, where have you laid your child? I'm going to wake him up. A backslider doesn't trace the dead. Haven't you seen the people that trace the dead in the Bible? Let's count them. Elijah. Elisha. Jesus. Paul. Peter. Which of them had girlfriends? Which of them went to prostitutes when it was night? You want to raise the dead? All these other places and churches saying, eh, eh, all these people play holy, 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 holy. We are not holy, oh, we know we are not holy. And then they will put their arms around uh, somebody who is not their wife. They say, eh, God doesn't reject that. They can never raise the dead. The people cleansing the lepers in the Bible. Count them. Who are the people that cleanse the lepers? Moses praying for Miriam, Elisha, Jesus, and the apostles because he sent them out. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse the lepers. Cast out devils. What, did they have girlfriends? Committing sin? Saying God will forgive, God will forgive. And living in immorality? No so want to be serious with God. They don't have anything to do with all those things. Whether you see them or you don't see them. And so, Elijah, when that boy had been dead, and the mother came, the widow, and said, You've called my sin to remembrance, man of God. He just went in there and said, Lord, with boldness, have you brought evil on the woman that I'm staying with? Raise this child. Glorify your name. And the child rose up. Not six hours prayer. Some of you that are wasting your time. Six hours. God, raise him up. God, raise him up. God, raise him up. Everybody's waiting. Then you sing cross. Then you call Jesus. Then you quote promises. If the power is there, you wouldn't be wasting time. When the power is not there, don't waste your time. Be humble and say, well, the power is not there. But the power will never come until all those things are settled. And eventually, you know, Elisha responded. Now, when Elisha responded, what was he doing? In 2 Kings chapter 3 and verse 11. 2 Kings chapter 3 and verse 11. But Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet? of the Lord, that we may inquire of the Lord by him, and one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shephat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. You know what Elijah was doing? Elisha was doing when he followed Elijah. He was pouring water on the hand of Elijah. What does that mean? You know, if you follow somebody to the farm and he's uh, walking with plow, walking with cutlass, walking with the hoe, walking with the axe, his sand is dirty, and then at the end of the day he wants to wash his hand, then you bring water in a bowl and you are pouring it on his hand. 
But you know what, Eli- what Elisha was before? He was the managing director of his own farm project. That's what he was doing before. You know what that means? That's the IFL. And you know what that means? It means that with all the twelve yokes of oxen, he was a person that was self-employed, a director, a manager, a person that was self-sufficient in business. If he employed anybody, he employed all those people to pay them. He was a leader by his own right. And then Elijah called him by the calling of the Lord. And what happened is that he was just pouring water on his son. He didn't say, no, I'm a big man. Pride will hinder you from being used of God. When God calls somebody, he doesn't expect that person to say, well, this is who I am. He wants you to say, without God, without Christ, I can do nothing. And in humility, he was pouring water on Elijah's hand. Other people will say, I've been a leader myself before. I had a farm project myself that I was handling. I, had, I handled big, big projects before. And they called me here just to be house fellowship leader, to take somebody else's outline and be teaching from that outline. Paul planted, Apollos watered, just to water what other people have done. No, I will never do it. I will go away. Goodbye. You'll never get the double portion. You are the loser. The kingdom of God will not lose because he's going to find out somebody that is wiser, better, humbler, holier than thou. But Elisha said, I don't care. I'm sure some of the people, they met him on the road and said, Elisha, what are you doing now? Just pouring water on the hand of Elijah? You don't mean it. You mean that all you're doing now is just following Elijah about and pouring water on his son? Oh yes, you don't have a ministry of your own, a church of your own, a pastoral work of your own, a ministry that is large and dynamic of your own. No, not at all. All that I do now is just to pour water on Elijah's hand. Ah. I can't do that, oh. Why should you do it? When God has not called you for the double portion. But if God has called you for the double portion, you'll say, I will do anything. I will serve anywhere, in all humility. You know, sometimes you have uh, some people. Now, their problem is that they have too many friends outside the body that they belong to outside deeper life. And those other friends, maybe they went to school together, IBTC together. And um, that other friend is in another ministry. And uh, he writes to this uh, person in deeper life and he says, uh, My brother, what are you doing now? Well, says, uh, I'm here in deeper life. Well, what do they call you now? Well, I'm an area leader. What does that mean? Well, it just means that um, we, you're wasting your time there in deeper life. In the church where I started work, when we came out of IBTC, you know, they made me a pastor immediately. And after one year, they changed my title to bishop. I am now bishop. You are just brother so-and-so now. I pity you. And you begin to think, my friend is a bishop. I'm only a brother. We came out of IBTC together. He is a bishop. I'm only a brother. Will I remain in this place or go to a place where I will become reverend, pastor, evangelist, bishop? You can go if you want to. But you'll miss something greater than being a bishop. You'll miss something greater than being reverend. It is not... Who man honors by reverend, it is who God honors by the double anointing. It's the honor that comes from above. That's what counts. Till today I'm not a bishop. I'm not reverend. I'm just brother. And yet, it is not in the title. It's in what God himself is doing. Which one do you want? Bishop? How many of you want bishop? 
laying empty hands on empty heads and having empty results. But being just a man of God, just a woman of God, somebody sold out to God, consecrated to God, and just a brother, just a sister, and God anointing you, that you lay hands on people and they recover. Which one is better? I think that is better. And so, Elisha, he was pouring water upon Elijah's hand. And some of his friends might have said, well, think about it. The choice you have made, the things you say you are doing. Oh yes, he, he said, I know what I have cho- chosen. And I know where I am going. Because God will bless the humble. He will reject the proud. Now, when we started, we started in all humility. Every one of us, state overseer, state leader, state representative, that's what we call them at that time. And whenever we are going to make an announcement, we'll just say, brother so-and-so, not bishop, not pastor, not teacher, not evangelist, just brother so-and-so is the one going to preach now. No pride. Everybody said, praise the Lord. It's good that I am in this place. But after some time, some state leaders want bishop. Reverend. Pastor. Great, great man of God. We can have all those titles and not have the power of God in our lives. And now we want to ride. Who wants to ride in a Vox now? Which state leader wants to ride a motorcycle now? No, that will be degrading. Is that so? Jesus didn't have a personal horse to ride. The only one he rode, it was borrowed. But he had a spirit without measure. Everywhere he went, the spirits cried out, You are the son of the living God. Why have you come here to torment us? I prefer that than riding Volvo. If the Volvo and the Mercedes Benz will take the anointing away, throw it into the river. Have nothing. Walk with your two legs. Be humble and have the power of God in your life. I prefer that. It's not the money, it's not the gadget. It's not the, how beautiful the house is. It's how overflowing the power of God is in your life. In deeper life, when the people were on fire for God, no pastor ever resigned because of salary. Saying, well, they have not given me money. How am I going to eat? Do you have to eat? How am I going to eat? Look at me now. I'm eating only one meal a day. That's good for you. In any case, you are even too fat. You need just one meal a day. Who is giving you two meals every day? Three meals every day. Some of you workers are eating four meals every day. I pity you. If your belly is fat, your head will be swollen, your spirit will be empty. There is a law of balance. You cannot take two sides. Think of all the people that are preaching prosperity, prosperity. They claim Cadillac, they claim Volvo, they claim Mercedes-Benz, they claim a duplex, they claim a house, they claim a car. That's all they claim. They never claim the power of the Spirit of God. Never. You can't claim both together. If the tummy is fat, the head is swollen with pride, the spirit will be empty. But when the spirit is getting full, the tummy will be going down. You check all those preachers. You check them. The fatter they become, the leaner their souls are. They can't fast. They can't pray. They can't wait upon the Lord. They can't look up to the Lord. They are not constant in following after the Lord and wait upon the Lord to renew their strength. All they want now is they want wealthy friends, good house, big car, large amount of money, and good food. And then when, when you have a pastor that uh, cooks and uh, uh, the wife cooks and uh, she's, he says, 
Sister, come. I look at the food you have put on the table. Is this what I will eat and be satisfied? He has a problem. Ah, only four pieces of meat. No, look, oh, this is no more 1977. This is 1987. 1977, when we used to think that if you are a pastor, if you are a worker, you mustn't eat much, you mustn't have this much. Now we must have everything. Just four pieces of meat, come and take uh, the plate. If there's no other meat, I will not eat. I'll go to the restaurant. Go to the restaurant and lose everything, the little thing that remains, lose everything. You see, I am now a pastor. You give me only one meat. Yes, the pastor should eat less than the rest of the people. I don't understand why pastors are fighting over bottles of Fanta. And he'll say, get out of that place. You are just an house fellowship leader. And only two bottles of Fanta remain. I want them. I, you, you know, I am pastor. The higher you go in the Lord, the less of material things you should have. The less Fanta. The less Maltex. The less of big bowl of rice the younger people should eat more because the younger are carnal but the older people should eat less because the older should be spiritual am I right oh you see is this what we have come to hear yes because this is what is destroying many people carnality Worldliness, obesity, pride, arrogance, the desire to have and have and have and have and have, no self denial again. That's what is killing people. Whoever died consecrated to the Lord because of consecration, no. The people that consecrate they are going stronger and stronger. But the people that are just amassing things of the world to themselves, they are the people that are losing out in the spiritual. I pray that this ministry will go on in the power of God. But it will never go on in the power of God if I, for example, if I backslide and the state overseers backslide and we put ourselves there and we say we are leader, we are leader forever while we are backsliding. While we can now talk and talk and talk and laugh, never pray, our prayer life decreasing, our talking life increasing, and we remain leaders, remain overseer, remain bishop, and just we remain on our chair of authority is going higher, and yet the power that goes along with it is going lower. The ministry will collapse. When all we have is more of material things. And we do not have more of spiritual things. You know what will happen? The whole thing will collapse. And they will say, they, even the neighbors, they will say, oh, deeper life. Oh, they used to be strong. That means history. They used to be evangelistic, dynamic, preaching in the village. Who will preach in the, in the village now? You can do it. When we first started, you could do it, but now you won't do it. Because when they say now, we are posting you to that village now, the first question is, brother, why me? You know that I've just got married. There's no electricity in that place. There's no water in that place. There is no good house in that place. I hear that the mosquitoes of that place, they can eat an elephant and finish before, morning, before daybreak. And that's why you are sending me. Nobody wants to go there today. Go to the local government area today. We all want to remain in the capital today. And if anybody is transferred out of the capital to go to where the people are suffering, where they have a need, no, he doesn't want to go. Because, you know, why should some people remain at the capital and be enjoying? And I just go to suffer. Not everybody will suffer. It's only the minority that will suffer. And those minority, they are the people that will have the greatest power of God in their lives. And I choose to be with the minority. I choose to be with the people that like to suffer. 
I like suffering. Because when you suffer for the glory of God, then the glory of God will be mighty upon you. Are you ready to suffer for the Lord? I want you to answer. Yes. Women, are you ready to suffer for the Lord? Yes. You know, some of you are wondering. I'm going to answer your question now. Women used to preach a lot in this ministry. You remember that? But you see, now they are not preaching anymore. Well, they are still preaching, but not like before. You know why? The fault is not with God. The fault is not with man. The fault is not with the ministry. The fault is with you. Let me ask you, women. That time you were preaching, when women were preaching, you could sleep on the ground. Can anybody tell you to sleep on the ground today and you will not frown? And you will not challenge your husband and say, my husband, what is all this? Is this how we are going to remain in this deeper life? What salary are they paying you, by the way? Well, this is the amount. What? We must leave this place. I'm telling you that if we're still sleeping on the ground, by this time next month, I'll quit from this house. I want to enjoy my life. There's only one life. That's why we have left you to enjoy and live the preaching of the gospel. Now, with four children and five children or seven children, and with wanting to eat very much, and you're all the time looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, look at how lean I am. I like to be big. That's why we like to leave you at the kitchen. Cook as much as you want. Eat as much as you want. But God will still use some people, like Deborah. He will still use them. Those Deborahs, they spend time on their knees, they spend time with the Lord, and they are bold, and they don't care if they die on the battlefield. God will use them. God will use Esther. Esther that can say, now you go and tell Mordecai, and the people at Shushan to fast for me. But I, myself, the queen, who have you got married to? Are you a queen now? Well, even if you are a queen, and you say like, Esther, I and my maidens will fast three days and nights without food, without water. That's why God used them. But when the women are after this and after this and after this and after that, that's why we just said that, well, you, didn't, you don't have the consecration you used to have, the power you used to have the boldness you used to have. I don't mean natural boldness, spiritual boldness. But if you're willing to come back and say, Lord, yes, we're going to serve our husbands, we're going to take care of our children, but more than that, beyond that, we're going to yield ourselves to the Lord and do what God wants us to do. The field is white before you. Now come back to Elisha. He accepted God's will and God's calling without delay. If you see anybody sleeping around you, help them because they won't get a double portion while sleeping. Is that possible? While preaching is going on and they are sleeping. So God will say, well, let me reward you with the double portion because you are sleeping while I'm speaking to you. Will God say that? Number one, he accepted God's will. Number two, there was humility and submission. Three, there was consecration and constancy, abiding in God's word. Number four, he separated from lukewarm observers. I've already spoken on, on all these things. Separation from lukewarm observers. Now, Elijah, Elijah said, Elijah, stay here. Because the Lord has called me unto Bethel. Oh, he said, as the Lord liveth, and as also liveth, I will not stay. I will go with you. That's consistency. That's consecration. And these sons of the prophets, they came to him and they said, Elisha, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from your head today? He said, I know it. Hold your peace. I'm not going to converse with you. I'm not going to stay with you. You are lukewarm observers and I'm not going to keep your company. 
And then he limited the use of his tongue. He watched his conversation. There are people that have this problem of talking too much. They talk and talk and talk and talk. And talk and talk and talk. And you cannot be talking like that and be prayerful. Even between husband and wife. That every day you talk at least three hours. Even after such a long fellowship in the evening, you come back home. Maybe you come back at 11 o'clock. And from 11 to 1, you still talk and talk and talk and talk. When do we pray? Elisha limited the use of his tongue. I know it. Hold your peace. Have you heard that so and so backslid? I know it. I don't want to discuss it. Hold your peace. Have you heard that so and so is going to be taken away to another location? I know it. Hold your peace. There's nothing to discuss about it. Do you know that so and so is no more in deeper life? I know it. I've heard about it already. But hold your peace. That's not my concern. That's between him and God. I don't want to talk about it. Hold your peace. That's what Elisha did. Do you know that Elijah is leaving the world even today? I know it, but hold your peace. But you know something? He respected and appreciated Elijah very much. Now this has surprised me. That Elisha had been with Elijah for such a long time. And this time that he was to go away, Elijah did not call him and say, I am going away. God has revealed this to me. And Elisha knew it. But there are people that know some things and they say they are, I don't know whether they are bold or they are just um, foolish. Everything they know, they go to the state overseer and they say, state overseer, let me ask you, I know this, I know this, you didn't tell me, but I know it. And so what? Maybe the state overseer will say, I don't want to talk about it, whether you know it or not. Well, that means that you don't love me. That means that you are not revealing everything to us. That means that this, that, Eli, that was not a problem to Elijah. He respected Elijah very much that he permitted Elijah to say whatever he wanted to say. Whatever he did not want to say between him and God. Do you know that God is taking your master away from your head today? I know it. I will not even discuss it with him. But hold your peace. Do you respect your pastors to that point? Or have your pastors become your colleagues? Or the general overseer has become your colleague? That if he doesn't tell us uh, this and this and this, for example, suppose I came right now, and I didn't tell you why I didn't come yesterday. I didn't tell you why I didn't come early in the morning. Would there be some people that will be saying, why didn't the general overseer tell us why he wasn't here from uh, 8 o'clock this morning? Are we equal? Am I your servant? Am I subordinate to you? Are you a committee of leaders to monitor where I go, why I don't come at 8 o'clock, why I don't come at 1 o'clock? Have we become so close, so intimate, that I must explain everything to you? Why I ate bread in the morning? Why I didn't eat yam? Why I prefer eating rice and not eating uh, your own samovita? But Elisha, he respected that man as a leader. And even though he didn't discuss, well, I am going off today, he just kept quiet. And when the other people came and were saying, this is what we know, this is what we know, he said, yes, I know it too, but hold your peace. The people who are going to go far with the Lord, they don't get bothered with passing of rumors and, inv and information. I heard, I heard, so and so is getting married. What's your concern there? I heard. Somebody is, uh, has got uh, the seventh child. What's your business in that? I heard that uh, so and so now is uh, now using this type of car. What's your business in that? I know it. Hold your peace. And then Elijah, Elijah said, I'm going to this other place. Oh, he said, I will follow you again. Eventually, when they passed over, when they passed over Jordan, Elisha was still following. And Elijah said, ask what you want. There must be asking and praying before you can receive. 
And there must be the willingness to consecrate, to match your desire. Some people have a great desire, but they don't have great consecration. And uh, Elisha said, I want a double portion. Now, but wait a minute. Elisha, why do you need a double portion? Because I'm taking over the ministry of Elijah. I'm going to be in his room. I'm going to do what he did. And I need a double portion to do that work. Now, woman, will God give the double portion to everybody that asks? No. Ah, you say, but the Bible says, ask and it shall be given you. I know that reference too. Listen to me. Suppose, Lord, going away from Abraham and going away to do his own thing, his own way in selfishness over there, called on God and said, God, I've read your promise and now I want a double portion. I said, whosoever asketh receiveth. While I'm over here on the plain side of Sodom and Gomorrah, give me the double portion. Will God give him? No, sir. Not to the man that has self-will. Gehazi followed Elisha also. Suppose Gehazi will say, after all, Elisha, my master, asked his son master Elijah for the double portion. Now, Elisha, what you got from Elijah, I want as well. Give me the double portion. Will he receive? The answer is no. Because he was covetous of the gold, the silver, the changes of raiment from Nehemiah. The people that God will give the double portion to are the people that stay at the center of the will of God. And the people that keep on following intimately, they are leaders that God has set over them. Not the people that are looking to those 50 sons of the prophets will wait for them while Elijah had gone. Are you intimate? With the leadership that God has placed over you. I'm not talking of familiarity. I'm talking of intimacy. In the sense of walking out of their footsteps. Getting close to the Lord through them. Accepting everything that the leader says as the Lord has said this through the leader. And I'm intimate enough to know how to follow. I'm not talking of being intimate to the point that you'll say, uh, state overseer, what did you eat this morning? State overseer, your belly is becoming big. And the pastor, general overseer, spoke and said, if you are big in the belly, then you are empty in the stomach. That's familiarity that brings content. I'm not talking of that. And Elisha was not familiar with Elijah to the point of almost abusing Elijah. I'm talking of intimacy. Following after the teaching of the word of God, taught by Elijah with all respect. And then he said, if you see me when I go, it will become yours. And that time he focused his attention on just that. Now, it so happened that no beautiful lady passed that time. Because no lady went to the other side of Jordan. The ladies don't go that far. Even the sons of the prophets, they don't go to the other side of Jordan. They don't go that far. The people that are just onlookers and observers, not consecrated to God, they don't go that far. But even if there had been ladies over there, I know that Elisha, when the master told him that if you see me when I'm taken away from you, it will be yours. Elisha was not looking around at every lady that passed by. Ah, look at uh, the way they made the style of their air. Is that important to you? Ah, look at that lady that is wearing slack. What's your business there? If you see me when I go. And he wasn't looking at all the people that were just observers and onlookers. He focused his attention on the greatest thing important to him in life. What's the greatest thing that is important to you in your life? The power of God. Then focus your attention there. The grace of God, then focus your attention there. The ministry that God has placed in your hand, then focus your attention there. Not looking here and there. Looking here and there. Eh, but I'm looking so that I can get married. That's how you want to get married, by looking. You get better wise by closing your eyes than by opening your eyes. 
you open your eyes to look around, you'll make a bad choice. Because Jezebels are more attractive than Deborah. Did you hear me? Deborah didn't have enough time to paint the eyelashes and the lips. But Jezebel had a lot of time. You don't understand that Jezebels are more attractive than Virgin Mary. And to choose Virgin Mary, you choose them by closing your eyes. And to choose Jezebel, you choose Jezebel by opening your eyes. And if you open your eyes, that's what they do in many places. They look around a lot. They look around a lot. With their eyes open, they get married, and there's a lot of divorce in all those places. Over here, thank God for what we're teaching you. I say thank God for what we're teaching you. Amen. I don't know anybody, I don't know anybody, sincerely, in deeper life, that has married in deeper life, according to the teachings we have taught, who has not closed his eyes or eyes before that marriage. Because we say, before you ever marry, go and seek the will of God. How do you seek the will of God? Go on your knees, close your eyes and say, God, give me your choice for me. While you are closing your eyes, looking away from the people, from their tribe, from their education, from all that they have, God says, with your eyes closed, that's who you have. But how do they choose them outside? They don't close their eyes. They come to fellowship, they open wide their eyes, and they look around. They say, I like that one. I like that one. I like that one. It is what Samson liked that killed him. And so, Elisha, he wasn't looking around. And he, he, there was nobody even to see. And he didn't feel lonely. He just focused on what was important in his life. And he saw when the Lord took him away, when the Lord took Elijah and said, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel. And the mantle fell down. When the mantle fell down and he picked it up, you know what he did? He tore his own mantle. The self. Self-will. Self-indulgence. All the things that relate to self. Tore everything and said, that was personal before. Now I take this mantle that belonged to my master Elijah. And he came on that river and said, where is the God of Elijah? And the sea parted in two. And the onlookers, the observers, they came to bow down before him. They never had it. They could never have it. But they recognized when the power came. And he said, the spirit of Elijah has come upon Elisha. When it comes upon you, people will see it. People will know it. Because he will do great things with your life. And he struck the water just like Elijah had stricken the water. Walking in the footsteps of his master. All this we need to understand. And say, Lord, I will not only hear, I will do it. I'll follow you. And I'm assuring you, because God is a faithful God, that double portion will come. I know maybe you are hungry, but let's see if praying is more important to you right now than food. Which one do you think is important? Do you think we should close and just say, well, 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 thank you for what you have said, but we are hungry anyhow. And the peppermint sellers are waiting for you outside. Orange sellers are waiting for you outside. And there are people, they never pray. They rush after that uh, message. They run to the toilet. At the toilet, they are discussing. How did you understand what the GS was saying today? Well, well, well. Well, I hear. But God will help us. Until the time of the praying is over, they are still discussing at the toilet. How will they have what they ought to have? Other people will say, well, since he was talking, I was writing notes. So I couldn't go and take my maltex. Now that the preaching has finished, let me go and quench my thirst and then I will come back. Before you come back, the angel of the Lord has visited his people and gone away. And then you go back empty handed. Why do you do that? You've been drinking that Fanta for a long time. Deny yourself this afternoon. You've been taking that food for a long time this afternoon. Why not just say, Lord, I 